So hi, I'm John. And I'm Joe. Welcome to our podcast, Extraordinariness. Where we explore the motivations behind ordinary people's extraordinary accomplishments. I'm Rachel Marsden. Um, I'm a nurse consultant for motor neuron disease in Oxford. Um, and I cycle with Kat. And in my cycling world, I'm called Raz. Hi, I'm Catherine Dixon, and currently I'm the Director General of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators. So my professional background is I'm a lawyer and um, mediator. Um, and when I'm not doing that, I'm uh, cycling, and uh, most of my cycling buddies know me as Cat. These ladies did something pretty impressive. Let's hear about it. So uh, Raz and I um, broke the world record for the fastest circumnavigation of the globe on a tandem and we uh, set the women's record uh, because we're women but we actually broke the overall record by which was the men's record by 17 and a half days. This is what I love about Kat and Raz I mean not only did they absolutely smash the world record but it was a record that was held by two men. So we um, yeah we set off we set off from Oxford and we rode across France to the sort of French Riviera, then uh, into Italy, over the border into um, Slovenia, then Croatia, Bosnia, Croatia, into Albania, uh, oh no, it's actually Montenegro, Albania, uh, Macedonia, Greece, into Turkey to Istanbul, which was sort of across uh, Europe. And then from uh, Istanbul, we carried on. Um, in Turkey, uh, following you know along the edge of the, the the Black Sea with some very terrifying tunnels, and into Georgia, then we took a flight to India to um, um, to Mumbai, um, and we rode around the coast of India from Mumbai to Calcutta, and we went into Myanmar, um, to Mandalay, down through into over the border into Thailand, then over the border to Malaysia and then to Singapore and then we flew to Australia and we crossed uh, Australia from Perth to Brisbane so we went across the Nullarbor Desert um, fortunately avoiding the the fires um, which were blazing while we were there so we had to take a bit of a diversion into an area of drought where it hadn't rained for three years so that was pretty challenging because it was about 45 degrees uh then we flew to uh, new zealand and we went um, south island to north island then we flew to the states to san francisco um down the coast and then across to miami and then we flew to morocco so up through morocco across into spain france and back to oxford and that was the that was the route is that the same route that the the guys did for their record, or can you alternate your routes? You can you can alternate your route. You can um, so provided you do eighteen thousand miles right. um, as a, as a minimum, and you you're going in one direction. So in other words, what you can't do is you can't sort of backtrack. Exactly. Or, you know you can, yeah you couldn't sort of say well I'll, I'll just keep going across, you know Turkey or or whatever else. Um, you've got to you've got to actually circumnavigate and you also have to go through to like the antipodean point so in other words you have to uh, at some stage be the opposite side of the world if that if that makes sense so we 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 were we had gibraltar and um uh new zealand in auckland were, were the exact opposite more or less the exact opposite sides of the world um and uh yeah so but then you can choose your own route so we you know we we did a route that um Probably is not the fastest route because you can take a faster land route. Um, so if you look at like people, what Jenny Graham and, and others have done, that's probably faster, but probably less enjoyable in terms of some of the countries that, you know, it's quite challenging, you know, some of the countries that she went through, you know, particularly Russia and, and places like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so that's that that was our route. So what brought them together? How did they come up with the idea? And, you know, what was the motivation behind this amazing challenge? So I guess... Um, so it came originally just chatting, as everything does, as you were just, you know, just saying that you have a little seed of an idea and it grows and grows. And it's Kat's idea initially because she wanted to cycle around the world. And I thought, wow, that's really a very cool thing to do. And she talked about that a lot. And then one day she said, well, why don't we do it together? And why don't we do it in tandem? And without any hesitation, I don't think there's much hesitation. I just said, yeah, OK. <laughs> Sounds like a, a fun thing to do. And then from there, I think it took us about a year to plan and think and um, put all the kind of 
kind of all the strategy together and yeah we set off and that's uh, that was it really quite simple in, a, in many ways so Kat spearheaded the event and Raz didn't need much convincing let's hear about how she came up with the idea I guess I'd always wanted to uh, to ride around the world and um uh, you know, Raz and I, we, we met on a, we actually met cycling. We we were doing a, a charity um, cycle ride from um, London to, to Paris and we started riding together and, you know, we started doing ever more difficult challenges, I think it's safe to say. And um, uh, we, you know, we just said, wouldn't it be great to cycle around the world? Yeah. And then, you know, let's try and break the world record on a, on a, on a tandem. And, um, you know, it was a sort of an unsupported um, world record. So um, it was just sort of the two of us on our, on our own. Um, you're riding around the world and you've got to ride a minimum of 18,000 miles, pretty much in, 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 in one direction. And, um, and yeah, off we went in, in June, a um, couple of years ago, and uh, just got back before the pandemic, and uh, managed to smash the world record, which was uh, which was fab. For a challenge of this scale, there's going to be some serious organisation. So between the two of them, I wanted to to work out how how the balance fell. You know, who took responsibility for for certain things, and how did they they split up the jobs? Well, we, the jobs between us fell kind of quite naturally into into two sections, really. So Kat was very much um, the route planner and organiser, and I was there thinking kind of the sponsorship, the money, the um, uh, kit, the all the other bits. And you know, so we worked quite uh, quite well together, really, just because we have different different skills, different skill sets. Both Kat and Raz brought different things to the table and seemed to work really well together. But these are two women who have really important jobs, families, friends. How on earth do two really busy women fit in this an epic tandem cycle around the entire globe? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I actually gave up my job Um and um, to do it, you know, because uh, for me, it was something I really wanted to do. And I thought, well, I'll um, worry about getting a job um, when I get back. But fortunately, I was uh, I actually got a job while we were doing the doing the challenge. So I was interviewed in um, in the States, in Tombstone, Arizona, um, for, for this for the current job that I'm doing uh, with the um, reenactment of the gunfight from the OK Corral going on in the background, and um, so yeah, and I think you know so that was lucky really in the sense that um, you know because obviously we got back and it was the it, you know at the, the point of the pandemic, but fortunately I had a had a job lined up, so um, you know so that kind of worked well for me. Yeah, I think it's slightly easier for me because I've working in the NHS for many years, I could take a, a career break. So if I took a break for less than a year, you can go back really to the same position you you were in when you when you left. So that was that was really lucky. I just took a, a break. Unfortunately my team didn't feel quite the same because <laughs> there was nobody there. But um I think from the family point of view, my children are all grown up and um at uni and left home and actually it was seemed like a perfect time to do this. The stars seemed to align for Kat and Raz when it came to this event, with Kat being able to take a career break and pursue a lifelong dream of cycling around the world and with Raz facing an empty nest and a perfect opportunity arising, it really did seem like it was meant to be. So I asked a little bit about where their love of cycling first began. Yeah, so I I, I, um, I started cycling late really because I um, I mean I've always I've always loved sport. I've always done a lot of sport, and I I used to run. Um, so I ran quite competitively, I suppose. Um, you know, at one stage, you know, certainly uh, sort of county level, I ran for the army. I, I'm sort of ex army and. Um, I also, uh, you know, I've run like the elite start at the London Marathon and, you know, so I used to run a lot. Um, and then I, um, you know, I, I, I struggled with my running because I, I've got I've got a bad back, basically. So I sort of started cycling 
um but not not really you're not really sort of competitively just just because you know it was it was a nice thing to do and then it you know I think then the sort of you know amount of it that I started doing you know kind of increased and you know when when I met Raz you know we we started doing more stuff so we you know we did quite a number of the you know European events like the uh the attack you know which is like in a stage of the Tour de France in the mountains and we've you know we've done that and we've done some of the spring classics like Liège, Bastogne, Liège and, and various other bits and pieces so I guess it it kind of just proliferated from you know from there really my cycling history well it's not quite like cats I suppose I've always cycled my mother's Dutch and she never uh, drove a car so if I needed to get anywhere I always cycled and I my first memories really are cycling and we had a little close and I'd have a little bike that I don't know who gave it to me but it was a little bit too small but when nobody was looking I used to cycle out of a close which you weren't allowed to and I could cycle all the way up to Walton on Thames library around the library and back again when I was six five or six and actually that was three or four miles <laughs> now and I just used to kind of set off and nobody ever knew and I so I that was kind of I just used to like cycling and then I always I cycled to work but I started training a little bit for when I met you know, when we were doing the uh, London to Paris because I've never really uh, other than day-to-day roundabout cycling I never really cycled so I joined the uh, Cali Road Condors just to get a little bit fit because I didn't want to die I wanted to enjoy it and then I met Kat and actually she what she just kind of inspired me to cycle more and she gave me the confidence actually she thought that I could do stuff and if Kat said I could do it I'd just go all right then I'd do it and um I could and uh I it, I had to work quite hard to kind of get up to her fitness level really because she'd always cycle along she'd kind of half wheel me and I was always trying to kind of work a little bit harder but I think I've actually managed to do that now a little bit still stronger than me but I can do that. And it's just been just the best journey ever. It's been so exciting. I love how Raz attributes a lot of her own achievements to the self-belief that Kat had in her and the confidence that gave her to, to pursue this sort of challenge and to keep going with her cycle training. On the other side, it's really interesting to hear that Cat was was in the army, and having spoken to a number of rather guests, you 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 recognise that that seems to be a running theme. And I'm just really interested to to find out whether or not she thinks that being someone who joined the army or was part of the forces influenced her self belief in herself. Uh, I was uh, I was an officer in the Royal Signals, and so I think um, you know certainly. I mean, I've also I I should you know I'm a mountain leader I'm a, a kayak um instructor and sea kayak guide and cross-country ski instructor and various so I've got you know I've done a lot of stuff I guess in the in the outdoors and I'm used to I suppose I'm used to sort of living you know in in the outdoors in in that sense that doesn't you know doesn't really phase me and I think it having that background and that experience was was I think helpful for the for the challenge. It really reminds me of my interview with Nick who completed the Great British Row with his partner Hamish and it, it goes above and beyond the fact that the army obviously provides training that would set someone up to be able to complete something like this but it's also the confidence that encourages people to take on these type of challenges that the army also seems to provide. I mean, it was a great experience. And I mean, I think, you know, for me, it was, you know, I, I, you know, I was fortunate that I, I held a commission so I was, as an officer. And, um, you know, I think that gives you, you know, the, the sort of confidence to, um, you know, to sort of make decisions. And, you know, it, it, um, it, I think it certainly helped me with my career sort of my latest career in, in law and, you know, given what I do now, I, I don't think that I would have been able to achieve the things that I've achieved, you know, without that experience, um, both the training, you know, going through Sandhurst and, um, you know, and the privilege of command, uh, as it were, <laughs> um, you know, so certainly it was, you know, it's a big impact on my, you know, particularly my formative years. 
Kat was obviously in a really good position in terms of her, her background, her training. But not everyone in the army does go on to complete something so extraordinary. And then let's look at Raz, who works for the NHS, who came to this event from a completely different background. So I asked her to talk me through how they set about making the plans and how it went on the trip. We, there was a men's record had been set, and I think from before we started, our aim was to beat that. And so we had worked out a schedule um, it enabled us to do that, but probably by a day. That's what we were thinking in, in, in that kind of respect. So we had worked initially to have a day off a week and to cycle kind of 70 miles and a day off a week. But as it turned out, we didn't have a day off a week. We had a day off a continent, probably. And we had a few days off um, where for in, in um, when we were kind of flying somewhere where we had to kind of pack up the bike and actually fly and then unpack the bike. So that kind of tended to be about two or three days in doing that. And then we got stuck in Georgia for a little bit because we were ahead of ourselves. We couldn't change the flights. So we had a kind of a forced uh, holiday uh, in Tbilisi, which was beautiful, waiting kind of just for the flight for us to kind of catch up with time because we couldn't bring them forward. But um, so we actually didn't have days off. We... um, that we'd, we'd planned and actually it seemed fine at the time we just cycled every day um and we had one day off in australia one day off in america one day off in, just in the continent so that was nice and that invariably we had a day off because the bike was being serviced so we you know found somewhere for the bike to be um to have a bit of uh, tlc and then we wandered around and uh, had a nice day off really for that so in terms of we had a risk we did kind of fall into a routine of uh, in the mornings and who got up first who cut off the creams and and yeah and I think it's very unusual to have to uh, to live with somebody 24 7 and for Kat to be able to put up with me for that length of time was quite extraordinary really. yeah that would seem to be one of the hardest bits I mean there's no time for there's no like me time you're no. just together the whole time. And that's, you know, that's pretty full on. Yeah. But they still seem to, you know... Like each like other. Like each other. <laughs> <laughs> As we ask all our interviewees, I wanted to know about their pit and their peak. I was really interested to find out if they shared the same highs and lows or if they experienced the challenge entirely differently. We went through about 25 different countries. Um, and for each of those countries, there'd certainly be sort of a high point and a, and, a, and, a, and a low point. I think, um, I mean, I think just generally being on the bike and sort of seeing the world by bike, you know, was, was an absolute high. And there wasn't really a day where we didn't, you know, we didn't really want to get on the bike and, and, and ride, even though, you know, it, it was pretty <laughs> exhausting. I think, I mean, I, you know, in terms of some of the countries that really stood out, I mean, I loved cycling through Myanmar. Um, we went from Mandalay um, over the border into, into into Thailand, so right through the country. And you just think, given what's happening there at the moment, you know, that we wouldn't have been able to, to, to do that. But the people were just absolutely lovely, incredibly courteous and, and very calm. And um, there was lots of tea, tea stops that you could, you know, en route, which was, uh, which was, which was really lovely. Um, and that, I think that, you know that the you know that was a real sort of contrast with the phonetic India, which I also loved, but it was pretty exhausting. You know, riding through India. I think if I had a if I had a low spot sort of on the ride, it was it was kind of unusual. It was probably the centre of America for me, and and not. And, and, and it was mainly because it was very, very difficult to actually get anything decent to eat. <laughs> I don't know that might sound um, a bit ridiculous, um, given it's America. But um, when we were going through the, the sort of southern states, you know, it, it is fried, you know, fast food. And, and um, we were also being sponsored to stay out of McDonald's. Um, somebody said they'd give 500 quid to our charities and we we had uh, you know numerous debates about about whether we could sneak in even even to use the lose but we didn't um 
but it meant that there was you know it I felt nutritionally that's really when I started to suffer and uh you know physically it really impacted on on me so my cortisol levels were very going up you know the you sort of stress hormone you know mm-hmm. put your body under that much pressure and things like that so that that for me was 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 hard and it, it was all about food actually a woman after my own heart so Kat found her biggest challenge to be sort of the the food and what was nutritionally available. So let's see if Raz agrees. For me, going through um, Italy was like being on holiday. We really saw some fantastic sights, you know, a typical touring holiday, really, we did initially. And the one time that my heart actually skipped a beat is that we were cycling into Pisa and I had never been to Pisa and I didn't know what to expect. And we literally cycled, was cycling, and I had my head down, pedaling away. And Kat said, look, and I looked up, and right in front of us was the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And it's like, what on earth is that? You know, it was just there in front of us. And I had, you know, it was, that was really exciting. We cycled around the buildings to it. So it was also raining, and we were really cold. And we found a cafe, and we had hot chocolate, which was like chocolate soup. It was the loveliest thing. And we sat there holding the cups, just trying to kind of uh, defrost our hands because it was really cold. But that, that was just all the pleasure of everything, just seeing pizza just like that. So such a surprise was lovely for me. And I think my low point is day four. Oh, wow. (laughs) I know. After that, it was absolutely fine. Day four, we were in France, stayed in this really awful place but I went to find coffee and came back with the nastiest coffee you ever did ever did taste it was just disgusting in a plastic yuckiness and I don't know that just set me off thinking really we really we've got to get around the entire world and this is awful but anyway Kat sorted me out told me gonna go and be a stern speaking to you and we went on our way and that was it that was fine but I just thought oh god what do I let myself in for but it was fine after that no worries and if I didn't have such rubbish coffee it would have been fine it sounds like all the lows were food and coffee related and I can completely agree oh I relate 100% yeah there's not like just you're in France surely you should be able to get a decent espresso or something like that but what got me was how early yeah that was fun. that's what I mean like I might expect it as you're maybe going through the Balkan states or something like that I just wouldn't expect it in France you'd think in France you can get a proper coffee yeah <laughs> but to, for, to hit the low at day four yeah, I mean yeah. surely then the only way is up well it, yeah and I mean um, I, again I can completely relate to uh, Kat talking about the inability to get you know decent food and I've done events before where all I've wanted is fresh fruit and vegetable. And I'm not like that person normally. But that's, you know, I think when your body's gone through something like that, you just... Well, it tells you what it needs. Yeah. I don't have anything comparable to relate it to apart from when I was pregnant. And I was very specific with what I required <laughs> at specific times. And if it was not available, I mean, John, all hell broke loose. Yeah. <laughs> But beyond that, you know, the, the physical impact on, on their bodies, where were the injured, did they struggle to get up in the morning? I mean, this was a big, long endurance event. Surely their biggest challenge wasn't fried food and terrible coffee. You know, we didn't fall off. You're the best pilot. And um, yeah, we had got a bit sore, though, didn't we? Yeah, we got really bad saddle sore. Um so particularly in India and, and Southeast Asia. Um, so we we were trying, logistically, we were trying to get kit sent out to, um, you know, various places. And, and unfortunately, we, could, we couldn't get it through customs. So we couldn't get our sort of cycling kit, our shorts, that um, uh, we were getting them from Stolen Goat. They were kind of sponsoring us. And... Um, so we went into we went into India with the shorts that we've just cycled all the way across Europe and half of Asia in, and you know by this stage they were probably not in best nick. And then what happened in India was that the we know we were going to catch the tail end of the monsoon, but the monsoon actually extended, 
and so you, we were just getting wet, you know, every every day with the, with the monsoon, and um, and so you were just cycling in wet kit, and you know, and the saddle sore was yeah was was really really severe, and you know we tried all sorts of uh, things, you know, but I mean it was still pretty pretty painful, and really I think it wasn't until we got to Australia. Um, where it was incredible, it was the absolute opposite of monsoon. Um, it was it, we were there well, during the uh, the fires and things. Um, but we got some new shorts, and it started to heal up. Um, but I mean, even now, I still my you know I still I'm suffering now with saddle sore that I would never never get before because it was yeah it was pretty pretty brutal. <laughs> I'm getting a real sense of really how important nutrition training kit is in in coming together to make this sort of challenge possible but thinking about the psychology of it you know was it difficult to get back on that bike every single day uh yeah at times it was yeah and it, you you kind of I mean initially when you got on it was the worst and then you kind of get into it but I do remember coming into Calcutta um where I uh, it was just like you know it was it was fortunate towards it was the it was the end actually of india and um i i, I think I, I i did it mostly off the off the saddle that day <laughs> it's quite a challenge on a fully laden tandem but i just thought i cannot i cannot sit on this anymore and then fortunately it healed up a bit um but we had all sorts of um you know fortunately being with a nurse you know you kind of come up with all lots of innovative stuff to stick on your bum to try and stop you from hurting <laughs> And actually, every morning when we got on the bike, it was it was oh ah uh, ah uh, oh ah uh, ah, uh, and then you kind of the bottom melded. You kind of the pain receptors kind of seemed to relax a little bit, and you just pedaled. But initially, every morning getting on, you thought that was really painful. <laughs> but it was all right. Ouch. Okay, so there was a lot more to it than just terrible food and and bad coffee. The girls were suffering. I wonder if they thought at any point that they weren't going to make it no no i I mean i guess the the only thing that got really scary at the end was the pandemic never any doubt from either of them i love that but these guys weren't just up against the the time that the men had set for the record they were up against covid and in those early days it must have been really quite scary I mean, we heard it r- roughly on the news, and I think um, when you're cycling and away from things, it was in the background all the time. Like we were it was probably we were, in the states when we know, first nice. heard about it, wasn't it? Yeah, but it was just in the background, and it was just nice to for it to be in the background, like Brexit and <laughs> and COVID. That we were vaguely aware of things, but they weren't impacting on us, and we just kind of kept up to date a little bit but not a lot but it was there somewhere but I didn't we didn't really anticipate um just how uh, you know just what was going to happen I think we first heard about it in the states when we were, were and um and then we got into um we finished the states so we finished in Miami and we flew to Morocco um and I think you know I think at this point it was people were thinking of it as a bad flu you know that's how it seemed to yeah. to be. You know, um, and then we got into Spain, and it started getting more serious. And um, we had to ride across Spain. And um, those people who know Spain will know how how mountainous it is. So we had to go over the Sierra Nevada mountains, and then over you know through the centre, and then obviously over the Pyrenees. And we went through um, we went through Madrid, and I think you know I mean. Fortunately, we were ahead of schedule. So, you know, as Raz said, our original schedule was to beat the men by day, you know, because you only had to beat the record fastest ever. Um, and we were we were well over two weeks up at that point. Had we not been, we would have been locked down in Madrid because Madrid locked down and we wouldn't have got out of Madrid and they banned cycling in Spain, which would have been obviously challenging for us. Um and then coming up through France, everything was closing down. 
we couldn't you know you couldn't get in cafes so we you know it was difficult it was quite cold as well because we were coming back it, it's march sort of february time as we're coming back so you know you you kind of it, you know it's pretty wintry actually and so you know there was no way we could stop during the day to get a drink or anything like that so it was quite it was quite challenging and then we we finally got out of france on the day that they imposed the travel ban um so which would have stopped us potentially stopped us from riding um, and we managed to get to the port and we got the second class passenger ferry out of France um, before they completely locked down and then arrived back in the UK and everything's carrying on as normal. It's only when you listen to this post-pandemic, now that we're out of, of lockdown, that you realise quite how tight it was. And not knowing how serious it was all going to get, I asked them, did they have to, you know, change their plans? Yeah, we had to speed up because we planned, well, we finished on the Wednesday before lockdown in the UK on the Monday. And that was the, and I think they locked down in France on the Tuesday, which was when we, when we left France. But had we been on our original schedule, we'd have probably got stuck in, um, well, it's probably, we'd probably got locked down in Madrid, actually. The pandemic really was hot on their heels. And how strange to have experienced this amazing journey where they got to see the world and spend time one-on-one together to all of a sudden, not just coming back to reality, it was coming back to a very different form of reality, you know, coming back to lockdown. I asked the girls how they dealt with that. Uh, I think, do you know, I think we had... We'd worked out and we'd learned and I'd learned a lot about our resilience. And I think, if anything, that came into play a lot more than you'd imagine when we got home because things changed. Um, I think when you live with somebody literally 24-7, they become like a shadow. You second guess. I know, you know, half the time the cat didn't need to say anything because I knew exactly what she was thinking. You know, we just, you're just so in tune with we were in tune with each other partly cycling so you have to be in tune in that and we you know, when cat changed gear i knew before she'd done it i knew what she's doing so we were we were so in tune and working as a team really and then you come home and from that point cat went back and i went home and you're kind of missing the other half of yourself that's the weirdest thing but you don't can't put your finger on it because it's lovely to be back but yet there's a big something missing and then for me and cat started working it's slightly different but i um i was back for a few days and i was called to say um what are you doing tomorrow and i thought i thought wrongly that they were going oh how nice i'm going to pop around and see you or you know have a coffee or a chat and they said no we're just having a meeting can you join us at 11 and so I joined the meeting, which was on Teams, which I never didn't even know how to do. And because I was faffing around with the computer, I joined late. They were all talking on the computer, my team, and um, they went, oh, hi, Rachel, really nice to see you. Not another word about it. And then I was back at work and that I had work to do and that was it. And then I didn't really kind of... No, I don't know what I expected, but there was definitely no fanfare. And... I kind of came off that call and felt like I'd been hit over the head or bumped in the stomach or something, and that, and that was it. That just sounds so awful, not being able to celebrate what you've just done. Uh, yeah, after such a massive achievement, that's one thing. But it wasn't that Raz was just going back to your, your sort of standard nine-to-five, maybe adjusting to working from home. She was going back to being a nurse in the NHS. So, yeah, you know, during a pandemic, that's pretty tough. It was just not the job that she left behind. Yeah. The hard thing was everybody else was suffering, probably more in a or in a different way, and they had lots of other things on their mind, and you know, for our patients and things like that, that was the priority, and everything went on on the back burner really, and the trip in the in a haze of smoke, it felt like. I mean, it is a tragedy, really, that achieving something so fantastic and breaking a world record, had to take a back seat. But I guess that's what happened for everyone when it came to COVID. Yeah, I mean, I think, it. you know, we just had, 
um, I mean, we'd, you know, there'd been lots of things lined up for us getting back and they all got cancelled. So we were due to be on breakfast TV and all of that sort of stuff. And it all got cancelled because of the, because of the pandemic and, you know, understandably so. But, uh, you know, we just had this, um, you know, this, this sort of level of freedom where we were out every day on our bikes and, you know, you know, every day was a different adventure. And then we went into lockdown. And so, you know, from that into lockdown, you know, it was, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty challenging. And I started, I started my new job, um, you know, and I was sort of leading, leading, you know, cause I run the organization and I was sort of trying to lead that. And I'd been doing it all virtually. I've been into the office even now, just a handful of times. And so, you know, so it's been, um, you know, it's a really strange time for us all, hasn't it? You know, but it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a real sort of contrast from, you know, being <laughs> being on the road to um, you know not really being able to go around the corner, you know, because you were you're sort yeah. of um, in lockdown. I think you know I was the navigator. I actually think I took a wrong turn. <laughs> I took a wrong turn, cat. Came back to a different world. <laughs> <laughs> not the one we left, that's for sure. Oh yeah, it just sounds so tough. Did they miss each other? Well, I do ask them this actually because they came back to to lockdown, so they wouldn't have been able to have seen each other yeah so I, I did ask them how long it was before they got to hang out again I think it was about three months wasn't it before we saw each other because we were um, yeah because it locked down and um you know it was it was because we you know I, I was in York at the time I'm in London now but um Raz was in Oxford so you know we live in different places in the country so it wasn't as if we were living locally and of course you couldn't you couldn't travel so you know that was that was that and I think we we um we sort of we met up when the some of the restrictions eased and we went riding in the the peak district I think I think that's kind of where we where we felt sort of first first saw each other and and Guinness were also doing um a feature so they led with when they launched the the book so the Guinness Book of Records they led with our story um so they, um, you know, they wanted to do some some filming and take some photos and things like that. Um, but, you know, we hadn't, I think it was, I think it was probably about three months. And so, you know, we'd gone from this kind of, you know, day-to-day sort of existence to um, lockdown and not seeing each other and all the stuff that we'd planned to do, you know, the parties and the celebrations and all that sort of thing, you know. And the amazing journey we had, that was, that's still special. That's, you know, that's always going to be there. Mm-hmm. And we didn't do it for the accolades, you know. It was just, um, you yeah, know, we did it not. for no, the no. challenge and the experience and, you know, um, all of those things, not for people to say, wow, oh, well done. You know, it wasn't about that oh. for us. It was never <laughs> about that. But, um, you know, it, it was more coming back into into a world of lockdown, you know, having had that that sort of freedom yeah of course and um, so we're, we're coming up to a close but if I'd be I'd love to hear um who or what your biggest inspiration has been or is I don't know I mean I suppose I've always I've always been inspired by you know by sport and you know by that that sort of a, achievement in sport you know when I think about you know, I mean, I've been I've been fortunate in that I've had um, you know quite a successful um, career, but you know, I think you know when I when I think about some of the things that I've achieved, I always feel I always almost put the sporting achievements <laughs> before anything else, and so you know, so the people that that kind of inspired me, you know, the kind of I suppose you know a lot of the athletes that I, I used to watch when I was. Uh, you know, when I was sort of um, younger and, and growing up and trying to aspire to to, to them. But I'd, I wouldn't want to name anybody specifically. I think, you know, and I think, you know, watching the Olympics in the last few weeks, you know, you can, you know, they're, they're all inspiring. I mean, the, you know, just watching the, the 13-year-old on the skateboard yeah. you know, yesterday. I mean, just amazing. And, it, you know, you get that lift, don't you, just from watching, watching those people. And I think I've always, I've always had... I've always had that and I've always wanted to do, um, you know, something with my sport that, you know, hopefully inspires others. Um, and, you know, hopefully the world record, you know, particularly doing it, you know, cause we are in our fifties, um, 
doing it at this stage of life, you know, we will hopefully be inspiring to, you know, other women, other women cyclists. Fantastic. And Rachel, your biggest inspiration? Um, I guess in the world of nursing, there's, there's nurses that I work with um, that I've aspired to and um, trying to, yeah, academically. And they, and I think that's, as Kat said, that's one side. I think, you know, I am going to name names. I am going to name names. I think my biggest inspiration is Kat. She's made me um, do things I never thought possible. And always, you know, even when we first met, she'd say, oh, let's do this. And I'd go, really? And she's, yeah. And I just thought I had the confidence in her to think, if she thinks I can do it, then I probably can. And I did. And once I did that, Kat thought of something else to do. And it's constantly, she's pushed in a, you know, in a way that I don't think anybody else has ever kind of challenged me like that. And um, yeah, so I think Kat is definitely, has to be my inspiration. So what do you think? It's pretty impressive, right? It's very, very impressive. And it sounds like they really enjoyed themselves. I know. And when they reflect on it, it's still really with a lot of fond memories. But then when you delve deeper, you, they wear up against it. But it doesn't... They don't. So that's what I think I mean by they really enjoyed it. It doesn't sound like it was a race to them, yet... They completely smashed the record. You know, they got held up in was it held up in Georgia? I mean, yeah, I mean, fights? they would have been, they would have done it quicker. Yeah, and they smashed the current world record held by two men. Yeah, and you know, these are two girls in their fifties. Well, by and seventeen that was days, John. Something that was really interesting. One of them said uh, that I think it was Cat. I think it was Cat said she wanted to inspire uh, women to do things like that. I'm inspired. Good. That I want to be able to carry on doing things like that into my fifties. Yeah, you know, the idea that, that, that you go and completely smash a world record in your 50s is just incredible. I know. And, I mean, that's the first time they ever really mentioned their age um, because at no other point was it a factor. Yeah, yeah. You know, not through their training, not through the event, not through their approach. At, at it's no probably point beneficial, to be fair, in, in that the sort of the, the... You know, it must have been a mental game to get on the bike every day and to cycle every day. Mm. And maybe having that experience and having that wisdom and being a little bit older... I mean, they're not old... But being a little bit older and sort of having, I don't know, maybe perspective on what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, I just think they're, they're incredible. So we should probably have a think about what we're going to put in our toolbox. There's working as a team. There's accepting your differentiated roles within that team. Yeah. And they did seem to have a good balance and a, a really clear division of, of roles. And that differentiated roles that knowing exactly what your your job is in the team what your task in the team is can only come if you have unwavering trust definitely at no point did they question each other's ability yeah it's almost their superpower they just have complete trust in each other so when you bring that together that reinforces their faith in themselves ultimately. yeah so that's it's that, that's perhaps that's where the resilience comes from so into the toolbox in this week is going to be uh, trust, basically. So if you're doing something in a team, you need to make sure the person that you decide to do it with, you trust and you trust each other implicitly. I would love to know if the, 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 they talked about the men who previously had the record. I would love to know what the dynamic was like there. And I wonder if there's a potential for more ego. And whereas these two ladies sounded like, you know, there's... Oh, there was the, no ego driven no. here. Even when they weren't able to celebrate it. And that, again, was just for their, their own sense of achievement. You know, Kat mentioned that it wasn't for the accolade. It wasn't for yes, the yeah, record. For the adventure. That was just the goal they set. Yeah. I mean, amazing. Yeah, I had a struggle with that. I had a struggle with not being able to, you know, like, uh, wear my finisher's shirt, as it were. You yeah, know, you want of... the glory. <laughs> it's not the glory. You, just, you know, you just, well, you're proud of what you've done and you want to tell the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, that would have been really difficult to not even get to ride the wave. You know, as Raz said, that first 
Google Teams meeting that was set up, she really expected to be a bit more welcoming, a bit more yeah. well done. Something and it else was... had come up that was bigger, she said. Yeah, and yeah. they just had to. And man, she that. just knuckled down and got on with it. Cracked on. Yeah. Happy days. So maybe that goes in the toolbox. Just get on with it. Yeah, <laughs> crack coffee's, on. Coffee's rubbish. Get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. really. Thank you for listening to Extraordinariness. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and maybe leave us a review. And if you have a story of an ordinary person doing something extraordinary, send us a message through our website, extraordinariness.co.uk.